And we are about to start. I'd like to introduce Melissa Hawkins to start us off. Melissa? Good morning. I'm Melissa Hawkins, the director for the Office of Deaf and Hard of Hearing. Thank you all for joining us today. We are thrilled to have the Office of Civil Rights come and present to us today on the importance of effective communication in healthcare setting for individuals who are deaf and hard of hearing. This presentation is very important for anybody who has joined us and for those who could make it. We will have this recorded and it will be available later on our website for those of you who are unable and you know of somebody who might appreciate being this recorded. There will be discussion about laws that create protection for any individual who has hearing loss. I'd love to introduce you to Cooper Townsend and Kathy Hushman, who have joined us from the Office of Civil Rights. And with that said, please listen to what they have to have today, and hopefully they will provide invaluable information for all of us in the deaf part of hearing and deaf blind team. Again, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Melissa. Right, one second before we start, I want to make sure everyone understands that we have an interpreter on the screen, but if you would like to watch a deaf interpreter, at the bottom of your Zoom screen, there's a little picture. It, it looks like a ball or a globe, and it says interpretation. Click on that button, and you will have a window that pops out and you'll be able to see the deaf interpreter. Thank you. And now, thank you, Cooper and Kathy. Great, thank you. Good morning. Um, thank you, Melissa, for the introduction. Um, as Melissa said, Kathy and I are here today uh, representing the Department of Health and Human Services Office for Civil Rights. And we're here to talk to you today about effective communication in healthcare settings for individuals who are deaf or hard of hearing. So let's go over a little bit about what to expect in the presentation today. So our agenda includes a little bit of a background and introduction, um, a little bit about deaf culture in the community, uh, effective communication and auxiliary aids and services. And then we'll go over two cases, uh, which will serve as examples and will showcase how OCR, the Office for Civil Rights, um, triages complaints and handles complaints dealing with effective communication concerns. And lastly, we'll have time for questions at the end. So the goals of today's presentation really focus on recognizing the importance of culturally appropriate care for individuals who are deaf or hard of hearing. And we also want you to gain a better understanding of the effective communication obligations under the federal civil rights laws. And lastly, we want to identify auxiliary aids and services for individuals who are deaf or hard of hearing and strategies for providing them in healthcare settings. So here's a little bit about the background and introduction So it's estimated that about one in four adults in the United States have some type of disability. And within that population, about 5.9% of those individuals have some kind of hearing loss. So as you can see the graphic, um, and it talks a little bit about the ways in which different disabilities can affect an individual's access to healthcare. 
I'll talk a little bit about that more on the next slide. So first let's talk about what is considered a disability. So in the plainest sense, a disability is a physical or a mental impairment that substantially limits a major life activity or major bodily function. So what's considered a major life activity? So that would be things like eating, sleeping, speaking, breathing, um, movement impairments such as um, disabilities related to walking or standing, lifting or bending over, also cognitive functions that affect someone's thinking or concentrating abilities. Um, sensory functions, seeing and hearing, and also major life activities related to specific tasks. So working or reading or learning or communicating would all be considered major life activities. And so major bodily functions pertain to just that. So we're talking about major organs like the heart, the lungs, the pancreas, or, you know, broader systems like the circulation or reproductive system in somebody's body. The important thing to note about um, the definition of a disability is that even if a disability is mitigated through some kind of medication or an assistive device, that individual is still protected and still considered to have that disability under the law. So there are a few things that, you know, you start to think about for individuals with disabilities when needing to access health care. So a few of those barriers can include, you know, physical, physical barriers, actual access to the medical building. For instance, um, having accessible medical equipment available, um, even dismantling misinformation and stereotypes about disabilities is extremely important to help with access. But we're going to be focusing today on effective communication, which is often a barrier for people with disabilities. So we'll talk a little bit about um, deafness and hard of hearing the population as a whole. So OCR recognizes that the deaf community here using Big D Deaf is a distinct community with called it is a distinct cultural and linguistic group. So that's to say that OCR recognizes that Big D Deaf often, reckon, um, often refers to um, deaf individuals who identify with deaf culture, consider themselves culturally deaf. Uh, they may attend schools and programs specifically um, tailored for deaf individuals, and they often, um, often identify with a strong strong deaf identity. So we also will recognize that when using little d deaf, it may indicate that an individual may not have attended schools um, for deaf individuals and does not associate necessarily with deaf culture and may identify more with hearing persons or you know may describe being deaf more as a medical condition as opposed to a cultural or identity trait. Um, and we liked this quote that said one of the biggest problems facing the deaf community is the healthcare industry's continued approach to deafness as a diagnosis to be cured. So that's added on this slide just to indicate again and to reiterate that the deaf community is and should be recognized as a distinct cultural linguistic group. So this is just a quick um, slide about ways um, we, you know, OCR would advise um, healthcare providers or other folks 
Um, they are intended to communicate with patients or individuals who are deaf or hard of hearing. Um, so as you can see, a couple examples are you can wave or gently tap the person on their shoulder to get attention. Um, don't, you know, try not to rely on lip reading as a sole means of communication. Uh, the person is wearing a hearing aid. Do not assume the individual can hear you. Um, converse in well-lit areas and minimize background noise and other distractions. Um, and use visual aids such as pointing to printed information on documents you may be providing um, a patient or individual. So here's just a graphic. Um, during the COVID-19 pandemic, um, a lot of difficulties occurred with deaf or hard of hearing individuals um, being able to communicate with their healthcare providers via telehealth. So healthcare providers are required to provide accessibility services. And there's two examples of accessibility services that may be provided in the telehealth setting. So the best practice uh, would be uh, a remote interpretation service, communication, access real-time translation, so CART. Um, and that's on the same screen. It's more um, integrated in a kind of a conversational um, platform with the provider and the patient directly. Um, so they consider that best practice. So there is an alternative. Um, it would be on separate screens or devices, and there would be either a remote interpreter or a captioning relay service, if the best practice, say, is not available um, at that time. So next I'm gonna pass it off to Kathy, who's gonna talk to you about effective communication and auxiliary services. Thank you, Cooper. Good morning, everyone. I wanna start by saying the first screen we're gonna look at here is talking about the three major federal laws that prohibit discrimination on the basis of disability. I'm trying to be mindful of the fact that we have about 125 people on this webinar. Some of you folks are going to be individuals with disabilities who are accessing healthcare. And I think that some of you are also from the healthcare community. So I'm going to, uh, Cooper and I are both trying to provide useful information to, to both of you. Um, but if we don't make it clear at some point, please let us know. So we're going to talk about the laws. We're going to talk about how these laws provide protection to individuals with disabilities. And they also require certain um, actions and certain um, procedures that need to be provided by healthcare providers. So looking at this slide, each one of these laws has a slightly different scope, but all of them contain requirements regarding effective communication. Generally, each law states that a qualified individual with a disability shall not, by reason of that disability, be excluded from participating in or denied the benefit of a program or a service or an activity that's provided by the covered entity. Each of these laws applies to different types of entities, but they can also overlap in some cases. So looking first at Section 504, we see that this applies to recipients of federal financial assistance, which we commonly refer to as FFA, and it applies to programs that are conducted by the federal government. Section, 50, uh, Section 504 is a broad law that covers not just healthcare programs, but it also covers programs such as social service programs, cash assistance, child welfare programs, things like that. Title II of the ADA applies to state and local governments, which are also known as public entities. Title II applies even if there is no FFA involved. And it also applies to all programs 
run by the public entity. So again, not just health programs. Section 1557 came about fairly recently in the history of civil rights laws. It came about with the Affordable Care Act. And it applies to certain health care programs or activities that receive FSA or certain programs that are run by state exchange, uh, health insurance exchanges, or run by HHS. Section 1557 is limited to health care programs. So obviously it does not apply to the other kinds of programs we were talking about, like social service programs. These three laws are the three laws that the Office for Civil Rights Enforces, HHS OCR. But many of you already know, too, that the Department of Justice also enforces these laws, especially Title II of the Americans with Disabilities Act, as well as Section 504. On this slide, we are talking a little bit more about how the three federal laws that we just looked at all require the provision of auxiliary aids and services in order to ensure effective communication. This slide specifically points out that qualified sign language interpreters are one form of an aid or a service, but there are others and we will look at other auxiliary aids and services today as well. So as you can see from this slide, these three laws ap apply broadly to a number of different categories in the world of healthcare, such as hospitals and clinics, emergency departments, outpatient surgery clinics. They also apply to activities like patient admission and discharging activities, and they apply to the broad concept of communication. Communications about the patient, communications with the patient or the patient's family members or companions. And that also, we'd like to emphasize, that includes even during rounds when a doctor is making their rounds with the patient. I wanted to spend just a minute on this slide, focusing a little bit about a category that's not often discussed, but it's the category of communication with family members or companions who are deaf or hard of hearing. A companion is defined as someone with whom it is appropriate for the provider to communicate along with the patient. So in order for the patient to have the same opportunity to access healthcare, the patient may want or need to have a family member or a companion present. So an example I like to share with folks is a case that recently was um, investigated by OCR. And this was a case where it, it involved a patient receiving services from an, an outpatient surgery center. And that outpatient center required all patients to have a responsible adult who would listen to the discharge instructions and arrange for the safe transport of that patient back home after the surgery. Now this was a requirement in order for a person to receive services from the surgery center. So if the patient shows up for his or her appointment and their responsible adult that they bring with them is a person who is deaf or hard of hearing, then the surgery center must provide appropriate aids and services in order to communicate effectively with the companion. I just wanted to mention that, keep that in mind as we go forward, and let us know if you have questions about that. This slide looks more closely at what is effective communication. While there is no actual definition for effective communication in the regulation, it is considered to be the outcome that is required 
when an entity follows its, its procedures and it provides its aids and services, the outcome is there will be effective communication. And what that looks like is that it is communication that is, that is as effective as communication with others who don't have a communication disability. So the Department of Justice informs us that the key to deciding what is needed in order to communicate effectively is to consider things like the nature or the length or the complexity or the context of the communication, as well as the person's normal method of communication. On this slide, we take a closer look at types of auxiliary aids and services. So here's a list of some aids and services that are commonly used to promote effective communication, including qualified interpreters who may be in person or they may be remote, note takers, TTY devices, written notes, large print or braille. So those are just some examples of auxiliary aids and services. Another consideration when talking about promoting effective communication is that the aids and the services must be provided in a timely manner and in such a way as to protect the privacy and the independence of the individual with the disability. And of course, they must be free of charge to the individual or the companion. So this may be a good time to take a closer look at a common aid or service that is very often relied upon by healthcare providers, and that is VRI, also known as video remote interpreting. VRI is a fee-based service that uses video conferencing technology to access an interpreter who is off-site and that interpreter provides real-time sign language or oral interpreting services for conversations that are happening between hearing people and people who are deaf or hard of hearing at a hospital setting or a doctor's office. What is important to remember, if VRI is chosen as the auxiliary aid or service, then all of the following performance standards have to be met. These are performance standards that are actually written into law. And the standards are that the VRI must be in real time, full motion video and audio, and it must be used over a dedicated high speed, wide bandwidth video connection or wireless connection that delivers high quality video images that are not supposed to produce lag or be choppy or blurry or have pauses in the communication. Also, if VRI is chosen, it must be providing a sharp image that is large enough to display the interpreter's face, arms, hands, and fingers as well as the face, arms, hands, and fingers of the person using the sign language, regardless of that person's body position. So in this instance, I'm sure some of you are thinking of times when um, you've had to use your own cell phone or a staff member has had to use a cell phone in order to connect with VRI, and that may not actually provide a large or sharp enough image or effective uh, communication. If VRI is chosen, it must also produce a clear audible transmission of voices and there must be adequate staff training to ensure quick setup and proper operation. Now on this slide we address the question of who gets to decide which aid or which service is needed. Even though we say here that a patient's preference should be considered 
and given weight, the regulation language actually provides even more clarity to that. And the regulation says that an entity shall give primary consideration to the requests of individuals with disabilities. The Department of Justice guidance indicates that the person's choice must be honored unless the entity can demonstrate that it has another equally effective means of communication available or that the use of the requested communication would result in a fundamental alteration of its program or it's an undue burden to the entity. But as we emphasize here on this slide, a person with a disability should be asked for their preference. Ask the person. Department of Justice guidance describes this process of asking the patient as an assessment of their individual communication need. And doing this assessment is important because individuals who are deaf or hard of hearing have different degrees of hearing loss. Some individuals may speak though they cannot hear. Some individuals may have different skills or may have secondary disabilities such as a vision loss which would require a particular type of an interpreter. A final note on this slide I just wanted to mention is that covered entities may require reasonable advance notice from people requesting aids or services, but they cannot impose excessive advance notice requirements. So if you are a walk-in and you request an aid or a service in order to communicate, that's okay. The entity must still honor your request to the extent possible. On this slide we look at uh, factors to consider when deciding which aid or which service to choose. These factors are fairly self-explanatory and we've touched on some already, such as the nature, the length, the importance of the communication. Um, the last bullet talks about something called reasonably foreseeable healthcare services. It's kind of a broad category, but it would include things like medical tests or procedures, meetings that you have scheduled with a healthcare professional. It could also even include discussions that you know are going to happen about billing or health insurance, and of course discussions that are clinical in nature such as about diagnoses, a prognosis, um, self-care, or discharge instructions. Now here we get into the role of qualified interpreters. In order to be qualified, the interpreter must be able to interpret effectively, accurately, and impartially and they must be able to interpret both receptively and expressively using any specialized vocabulary that is required by the circumstances. So we'll take a minute here to talk about what happens when family members or friends are available. The federal laws that we talked about before are very clear that family members or friends of the patient should not be asked to serve as interpreters, as they often do not possess the specialized skill that is needed to interpret effectively. And of course, there are times when a family member or a friend may be emotionally or personally involved, which could affect the accuracy of the interpretation or the impartiality of the interpretation. There may also be problems in maintaining patient confidentiality when a family member or a friend is involved. And finally, children should never be used to interpret. There's only one instance under law where a child may be used to interpret, and that is in the case of an absolute emergency. 
So to clarify, the law states that there are two situations when an entity could rely on a companion to interpret. The first is in an emergency, but it would have to be an emergency involving imminent threat to the safety or welfare of an individual or the public. In that case, an adult or a minor child accompanying the person who uses sign language could be used to interpret or facilitate communication, but only when a qualified interpreter is not available. Okay, so that's the first situation. The second situation is in situations not involving imminent threat, an adult who is accompanied by somebody who uses sign language may be relied upon to interpret or facilitate communication. When the individual requests this, when the accompanying adult agrees, and when reliance on the accompanying adult is appropriate under the circumstances. The second situation that we just talked about does not apply to minor children. On this slide, we include a few common questions and answers. Um, well, I'll, I'll provide the answers about interpreters. The first question is, do you have to provide an interpreter continuously throughout a long inpatient stay? Generally, the answer is no. It may not be necessary because not every communication requires sign language interpreting, and the entity should be assessing all the time the type and length of communication that is involved, as well as the complexity of the information being conveyed. So we understand, and certainly OCR has found, that it is likely that at many points throughout an inpatient stay, an interpreter will be required and then during other times for simpler forms of communication, there may be alternative aids or services which could be used to communicate effectively. Again, remember this is very dependent on the particular needs and communication skills of the individual. The second question is, do you have to defer to the patient's preference for a specific interpreter or interpreter agency? Uh, the answer that we have found is that no, you do not. The provider does need to give the patient an opportunity to request their choice and give primary consideration to that choice. But ultimately, the entity may provide another equally effective means of communication. For example, the patient may favor one particular interpreter or agency, but if the provider has a contract already with another agency that uses qualified interpreters, the provider may use that agency. Keep in mind the outcome is effective communication. The third question here is what if the patient refuses the entity's offer of an interpreter? but the provider still has some concerns regarding the effectiveness of communication, or maybe has concerns regarding con confidentiality. And the answer is that it is still ultimately the provider's responsibility to ensure the effective communication. So the provider may choose to get an interpreter anyway, or in the case where a patient is insisting that their companion be used the provider may still have its own interpreter present in order to verify the accuracy of the information being conveyed. On this slide, we rem this reminds us that people who are deaf or hard of hearing often communicate with their hands, so their hands should not be restrained or covered in healthcare settings. I would also add that entities need to be mindful that there may be a loss of function 
with a person's uh, ability to communicate with their hands. That may be due to injury, neurological impairment, illness. So where writing notes may have been okay at one time for short communications even, it may not be okay when a person is in a hospital or even in a doctor's office and they are there because they are experiencing loss of function in their hands. So that's going to require a different assessment and a different type of aid or service to provide communication. On this slide, we provide strategies for staying in compliance with the three federal laws that we've been talking about. The most important strategy is to plan ahead. Planning ahead is critical, and providers should always have in place arrangements to ensure that qualified interpreters are available, either for scheduled or unscheduled uh, appointments. Another strategy is to train staff on policies and procedures and how to access auxiliary aids and services. Uh, it would also be, uh, it would be prudent for staff to also be trained to recognize when someone may need an auxiliary aid or service. And staff should be trained on how to follow up with that person to determine if the communication is effective. Providing signs, providing notices, are always uh, ways of improving communication with the targeted population. And then finally, reaching out to community resources, such as national, state, or local associations for the deaf, or other advocacy or community-based organizations, also help uh, providers to uh, gain insight and uh, understand the provision of services that are most effective. The last thing I would just add to this slide is that it would, uh, that entities should on a regular basis check, replace, and upgrade their devices regularly. That, that also goes for their high-speed video or wireless connections. So uh, entities should take their iPads or their devices that they use for VRI, and they should test them in different places, such as hallways, elevators, ambulance bays. And where they find that there are connectivity problems, they should consider some other options, such as installing signal boosters or other types of technology to improve the reception. In this section, we are going to move into examples of investigations that have been completed by OCR. And the first one that we are sharing with you here is a case that was concluded in 2020. This case can be found on our website, as I think the next one can be also. If you go to our website, I will put that into the chat. And if you click on our newsroom feature, then you can find all of these uh, investigations that we've done in the past. In this case, we received a complaint from numerous patients indicating that a Texas-based healthcare system named Christus failed to provide adequate or timely interpreter services and failed to provide auxiliary aids and services to individuals who are deaf or hard of hearing. So after doing uh, some investigating into the allegations, OCR determined to conduct what we call a broad review of um, the hospital healthcare system policies and procedures for providing interpreters and other aids and services. And after we completed, concluded our investigation, we reached out to the Christus Healthcare System, and we offered to negotiate with them an agreement that would help them get into compliance with the three laws that we've been looking at, and to strengthen their provision of aids and services. 
So that negotiation ended up in something which we call a VRA, which stands for Voluntary Resolution Agreement. And that re Voluntary Resolution Agreement covered uh, different things such as performing communication assessment at patient intake and also reassessing whether or not communication is being effective on a regular basis. It also required the hospital healthcare system to improve and upgrade its reviewing process, its assessment process, its provision of qualified interpreters, including in-person interpreters as well as VRI. The agreement also required Christus to conduct annual training on effective communication and to conduct outreach to local disability groups on the availability that they are now providing aids and services and interpreters. One aspect of this case that was not included in the resolution was compensation for the complainant. I bring this up because I think it's important for individuals to know that when they file a complaint with HHS OCR, unfortunately we do not have the authority to request compensation for persons when we find that they may have been discriminated against based on their disability. So some of you may be aware that the Department of Justice does have that authority and in the past has routinely negotiated modest sums of compensation on behalf of individual complainants. This is another case that I think Cooper is going to discuss. Cooper, are you available? Yes, so much like the case that Kathy just um, discussed, um, Osier received a complaint from the parents of a deaf child that was undergoing physical therapy. Um, this was a six-year-old child and the physical therapy office failed to provide an ASL interpreter um, for the six-year-old's physical therapy appointments. So when OCR received the complaint, uh, OCR performed an investigation and found that the physical therapy office failed to perform or properly review and assess the ASL interpreters that they used. So they noted deficiencies in the policies and practices of the physical therapy office and also um, noticed that there were some issues in resolving grievances filed by patients. So much like the case that Kathy just discussed, OCR entered into a VRA voluntary resolution agreement with the physical therapy provider and as part of that agreement the physical therapy office was to provide um, auxiliary aid services to the patients they were to improve the review of ASL interpreters they had to revise their grievance procedures so that they could more adequately address concerns of patients. And they had to send OCR reports showing that they were complying with the agreement in which they engaged. This slide, um, Kathy mentioned before, are some recent cases um, centered around effective communication and like Kathy said, we can put the link in the chat box to the OCR website where you can see cases that were recently um, recently investigated and you know where there may be uh, voluntary resolution agreements with um, doctor's offices or hospitals, um, etc. Kathy's gonna back on and talk to you a little bit about some resources we have available. Kathy, you're on mute. Thank you. 
So when we go out and we speak, as I mentioned before, we speak to providers, we speak to recipients of federal financial assistance, we try to emphasize these learning goals, that they need to recognize the importance of culturally appropriate care for individuals who are deaf or hard of hearing, that they need to understand that there are effective communication obligations under the federal civil rights law, and that they need to identify auxiliary aids and services for individuals who are deaf or hard of hearing, and strategies for providing those services. Here are some resources that we wanted to share with you for your awareness, for future reference. Um, these are resources from a variety of different places, including the Department of Justice, um, our own website at OCR, Centers for Disease Control, National Institute of Health, and the National Council on Disability, as well as the ADA National Network, all have wonderful uh, resources about effective communication. And also, please feel free to reach out to the Office for Civil Rights directly. We're happy to provide technical assistance as well. So this is our section where we talk about questions, and there are some questions in the Q&A. who wrote this question clarified later that their question was if it happens to be a paid companion who is deaf, do the facility still have to provide the interpreter for the paid companion? Oh, okay, okay. I think I'm understanding. So an individual goes to a facility, their paid staff companion is deaf. Is that the question? And would the provider yes. still re be, re be required to provide auxiliary aids or services or interpreting for that paid companion? And the answer is probably because the companion is going with the individual to the appointment. The companion is there uh, serving a role with the individual so that the individual can access health care. So in that situation, it would be important for the provider to provide interpreting to the companion so that the individual can access their health care just the same as they would if their companion was a person who didn't have a communication disorder. I think that answers the question. I think so. And the next two are very similar. They ask if a family member who is deaf, companion, I think you said this, 
um, needs the access to the medical staff or or the hospital itself, the spouse or companion still qualifies to get that access so that they can be understand what their person is going through. That's exactly right. It's a little tricky, these issues or these questions about companions, but it's important to remember that the law protects individuals with disabilities, okay? So whatever access that individual with a disability should have, whether they're the patient or the family member, whatever access they should have, they should be provided with aids and services necessary so that it's effective. It's effective access. That's a broad answer, but I think that does cover some of those questions. Um, the next one is, it, what can a deaf per patient do when the medical staff brings a device in that they prefer not to use and tells the deaf patient they have to use it? And this is the most difficult question, and it's certainly the question that gives rise to the most number of complaints that we receive. So, as we talked about earlier, the first thing that should happen is there should be a, an assessment, a conversation, or a consultation. All three words pretty much mean the same thing, which is a communication between the provider and the patient that determines what the communication needs are for the patient. During that consultation is when the patient should express their preference to the provider and say, this is what I need in order to understand and to communicate. The provider ultimately makes the final decision. The provider has to listen to the patient and has to honor the patient's request if they can, but ultimately the provider gets to choose which method of communication is going to be used. But keep in mind that the method that is chosen has to be, and I'm using quotations, equally effective. It has to be equally effective as the communication method that was requested by the patient. So if the communication gets underway and the patient is not understanding, then that needs to be conveyed and then the covered entity, the provider, should reassess, right? They should say, wait a minute, what we're doing is not resulting in the outcome of effective communication. So when they reassess and they decide, okay, this isn't working, then there should be some alternative provided. I know that this is awkward because in real time, what does that mean? Maybe an appointment has to be rescheduled. Maybe there's a delay in receiving treatment or care. But hopefully, uh, the hospital or the provider can be nimble enough to look at what other aids and services it has at its disposal if they are prepared and they can adjust. Thank you. The next question asks, what happens if someone is asking for a live interpreter, meaning someone in person, because that the VRI is too small or too hard to follow? Yes, that's a very good reason to point out to the provider that this is not effective communication. The patient or the individual with a disability can say to the provider, I, I am not following, this VRI is too small, or the connection is too choppy, I am not able to understand what's going on. Thank you. Uh, the next question asks, if you have a website or a document that has the requirements for effective VRI um, and if you would be able to provide that. 
think what you're talking about is what we we looked at, which are the standards. There are actual standards that must be met for VRI, and that is actually written into the regulation. And if you give me just a couple seconds, I think I can put that site to the regulation into the chat box for you. Thank you. If you want to go ahead to the next question while I do that, that's sure. fine. Sure. The next question is, what is an adequate time frame for a hearing assistive technology uh, should be taken care of or maintenance or replacement of? What's an adequate time frame for maintenance, replacement of technology? That's the question, yes. There are no guidelines of, on that at all in the regulations, unfortunately. So I I think I would have to leave that to a best practices kind of a standard where a hospital has probably already in place or a doctor's office already has in place a certain schedule that they follow to upgrade their equipment and their capital expenditures. So that is what I would look to if I were trying to answer that question. I would say, what do you already do? How do you know when it's time to upgrade and repair or replace what you have? And that should also include all of your devices for communication. The next question is similar to the previous one, but I want to make sure that it's not a different answer. Um, the patient rel relies on a live interpreter specifically a local interpreter because of differences in language or um, understanding of someone who has a local dialect versus a, a another dialect. Can they request a specific person or a live interpreter to make sure that that is covered? For, um, so if I understand this correctly, the, the type of interpreting that is needed might be specific based on language or dialect? Yes. And can they, yes. Um, yeah, absolutely. We talked about that a little bit in one of the slides, which is that during that assessment process, those are exactly the types of questions that need to be asked, which are things like, what kind of interpreting do you need? If you have a secondary consideration, like you speak a different language, or you have low vision, or you have even a mobility impairment, would you need a certain type of interpreter? So yes, that has to be part of the consultation process. And then if, if it's necessary in order for there to be effective communication, then it has to be provided. Okay. Um, I have someone who... I have someone who is deaf who would like to make it to to ask the question, but I'm going to let her come in, and while we're doing that, I'll ask the next question. The next question says, "How is it considered appropriate to, in this kind of recorded public forum with the cloud of OCR, make anyone who is listening believe that they can reasonably act in a way that makes the deaf patient feel like they're a second-class citizen?" or far into their own country during a long hospital stay. Which by proxy means that is an important stressful situation where all communication is vital and needs to be effective. Right, that is a difficult question which we try to talk about a little bit on the slide which is when a person is I, I believe what you're referencing is when a person is in a hospital or a facility for a longer period of time receiving inpatient services. So I believe that's what the question is getting at. And the way that that is decided legally is again to look at things like the type of the communication that is happening, the complexity of it, the length of it, the, ability, the person's ability 
to communicate. And it's an ongoing assessment process. So no hospital or no nursing home should ever decide that I'm only going to schedule an interpreter on Mondays and Thursdays when the doctor is here. Or I'm only going to schedule an interpreter when the patient goes to physical therapy. So that is not what we were saying. It is an ongoing assessment process. So every single day may present opportunities when it would be appropriate for an interpreter to be there, either in person or through VRI. Okay, uh, the next person is a deaf individual who'd like to make a comment. Jamila, go ahead. Okay, I'm just making sure the interpreter can see me. I am deaf. My mother can hear, and she's from another country, and has a heavy accent, um, and I require American Sign Language interpreters. When we go to the hospital, I you know, request an ASL interpreter, and they say, no, we're not going to do that because the patient is not deaf, so we don't need to provide an interpreter. And I say, well, yes, but I'm going to be there, and I need an interpreter. And they deny me the interpreter. I had to hire an attorney to fight for this. And the um, attorney said that they couldn't help me because I'm not the power of attorney. And I was like, but that doesn't matter in this case. I don't have to be a power of attorney to accompany my mother to a doctor's appointment. Um, anyway, so even if the patient can hear and I'm deaf, um, I'm a family member. They still need to get an interpreter for me. And they said, no, we don't. So what actually does the law say in that situation? Because it's very frustrating to me. And. I, you know, we had a, pair, a caregiver professional agency that couldn't be a power of attorney with my mom because there was a conflict there. And so it's a, a challenge to me if the laws don't um, all agree with each other. So I'm very frustrated and I'm just looking for some advice in this situation. You're right. Uh, there are many laws that sometimes seem to conflict or overlap. So uh, keep in mind that healthcare providers, hospitals in particular, uh, typically start with consent, right? That's the first thing that they need to get from their patient. They need to get consent to treat or consent to assess or consent to provide a particular procedure. So that's what they're very kind of laser focused on at first is we've got to get the consent from the patient and then they go to who else is present. If the patient has another person present, they go to the question of whether or not it's legally appropriate to share information with another person. So that's kind of how hospitals approach these, these situations. One, they need to get consent from the patient that's informed, and two, do they even have authority to share any other information with anybody else? So those are laws that they have to respect and they do have to uh, comply with. And those are separate laws. The laws that we're talking about today would apply to the yeah, situation. I, I, I've already, they're, they're fine communicating with me, they just don't want to provide an interpreter, and English is not easy for me to understand. Correct. So the laws that we're talking about today provide you with that protection, provide you with that right. They are overlapping to the laws that the hospital has to also comply with. So you come in and you are a family member or a companion to your mother, and it's at your mother's consent that you're there. It's at your mother's request that you're there. You do yeah. not, right, you do not have to have power of attorney. You do not have to have any legal document. 
for you to stay in the room with your mother. So right. again, and the advocate said, no, I don't know. It's just, it's just very mind boggling. And, you know, with the caregiver policies, um, with the home health care, um, because she was getting that service, then I couldn't do, you know, POA at the same time. And it was just it, a big uh, circus. It, it's it was quite difficult. Very traumatic. All right. And it is confusing. It's confusing for, for us, the people who work in disability rights and the enforcement of disability rights laws. And it's also confusing for the providers, the home health care agencies. Um, but ultimately, it boils down to they do need to get the consent of the patient for you to be there. But as long as the patient says, yes, I'm okay with my daughter being here, then they also have to provide you with the aids and services that you need to understand what's going on for your mother's care. Right. And now, you know, my mom, it is, it is, she's very, very seriously uh, in dementia. And she actually calls me her mother now, not her daughter. It's just a very sad situation. I'm sorry to hear that. I'm glad that you're there, though. You can support your mother. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Jamila. The next question we have is did any of you ever have a nurse demand that you surrender your hearing aids i did she told me that she would get yelled at if she couldn't collect them from me and demanded to i demanded to speak to her supervisor and explain to the supervisor not to blame the nurse but that i wasn't going to surrender my hearing aids because i can't hear without them Medical people have no clue how to de deal with hearing impairment. They talk over us like we are children. How do we get these people to learn and work with us with sensitivity? That's a big question. I don't know if there's a simple answer. Um, I, I do sort of like some of the suggestions that we have in our presentation today which say to providers to doctors they really should communicate with community activists community partners if they want to understand if they want to provide good quality health care then doctors and hospitals should have consultations with the community partners they should ask those folks to come in and train their staff so that there's awareness about the way patients feel. It's not required by the law. OCR can't force them to go and get that kind of training. But if they don't get that kind of training, then we will get complaints. So we will go and have our investigation and we will at some point be talking about this with them. But it is tough. It's frustrating. The next question asks about CART or real time captioning. Um, for telehealth providers, are they able to contract with a CART provider and add it to our telehealth sessions? Cooper, did you want to talk about that? That was on your slide about telehealth session right so uh, mentioned earlier in the presentation that CART is the considered best practice um, to have um, the doctor interpreter and patient all on the same screen um, as far as if uh, medical um, you know doctor's offices hospitals if they can contract with interpreter services. Um, I think that is very dependent on the patient provider. Um, the answer is going to be different um, depending on the health system that you know that you're seeing at or what doctor you're going to, but um, that should be an option um, if it's available. 
on in that in, in that area, um, and it's definitely something to discuss with your provider um, to say, as as Kathy was describing before, um, when you, when a patient um, you know makes their you know their primary request to a provider when they're having that conversation with their provider about um, their needs for communication. Um, that that's something that should definitely be brought up, and to just you know to relay that information to the provider um, to try to make that available for the patient during a telehealth um, session, for instance. But yeah, the answer would be it would depend on the provider, and it would be something that I would suggest that you would rely um, relay sorry to the provider um, when having that conversation about. Um, The next two questions are about procedures. Um, how long does it take from stage one to the other stages in the process? They want to know um, when OCR gets a complaint and they start the investigation, how long does it usually take? Um, we don't actually uh, have a schedule, unfortunately. Uh, it's dependent on a number of factors. It's dependent on um, how many complaints we are currently dealing with, how many investigators and staff we have available at any particular time. It also depends on factors such as what priorities are for the agency at that particular time as well. So unfortunately, it can, it can be relatively short period of time or it can be months, if not years. Uh, one of the things that we try to do when we triage a case is we try to look at the particular instances and we try to think about ways that we might be able to resolve a problem quickly. And if we think we can get the problem resolved quickly, we might just informally reach out to both the individual and the provider and we might just try to bring them together and to try to what we call do complaint resolution. Um, and that is actually a, it's a method that works pretty well for individuals who have communication disabilities because frequently there'll be a, an appointment coming up and you need to have something in place so that there will be effective communication. So we have had some good success in the past using complaint resolution, um, which is our informal method of addressing a complaint so that a person can can have that auxiliary aid or that service available at the next appointment. So maybe keep that in mind if you do want to or you think that you need to file a complaint with our agency. You may ask for us to just reach out informally and do early complaint resolution going forward instead of a full formal investigation. I have one last question. Um, how can the staff be qualified to determine what a deaf patient's accommodation needs are? Well, there's no legal requirement that they have to determine what the needs are. What they are required to do is to ask what the preference is for communicating and then they are allowed to choose what they think is effective communication in order for that person to participate in or benefit from the service or the program that they offer. But as we talked about before, the outcome has to be effective communication. That's the, the bottom line. And if there's still confusion, if um, there's not clarity in the way that the information is being conveyed or the discharge instructions are given, then it is the responsibility of the provider to reassess and decide that maybe they need to provide a different means of communication. Thank you, Catherine. We're running out of time. Um, thank you everyone for your participation. There will be a recording of the presentation
We hope to have it out to everyone soon. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you, everyone. It was our pleasure.